we're really excited for you to join us for our weekly Meet the Artists. Um, we meet every Thursday from 5.30 to 7.30 to hear local and visiting artists talk about their work, their process. Um, sometimes we have our artists in residence, so it's a great opportunity to get to know the work of artists that might not normally come through the area. Um, tonight, oh, before I get started, um, the work on the wall is our current exhibition of Brenda Ann Keneally's work. Uh, she'll actually be doing an artist talk on the 19th. So if you're looking, hey, if you're looking, welcome to learn a little bit more about this work. That would be a great opportunity. Tonight, we're joined, um, I'm very excited about this. I've been, um, uh, sort of seeing Virginia's work from the outside for a while, so I'm looking forward to getting to know it better. But we're joined by Virginia Hnusik and Nicholas Pollock. We'll start with Virginia. Um, Virginia Hnusik is an artist whose projects investigate the relationships between landscape, architecture, and visual culture. Her work has been exhibited internationally and supported by the Andy Warhol Foundation, Pulitzer Center, Graham Foundation, Landmark Columbus Foundation, and Mellon Foundation. She's on the board of directors of the Water Collaborative of Greater New Orleans, where she coordinates multidisciplinary projects on the climate crisis and is a founding member of the Brackish Artist Collective. That feels very pertinent right now, considering what's going on in the Mississippi. Yes. Uh, her first book, Into the Quiet and the Light, Water, Life, and Land Loss in South Louisiana, will be published in spring 2024 by Columbia Books on Architecture in the City. She lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. Let's give Virginia a welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, can you hear me? Or should I move it? A little closer. Um, no, that's perfect. Hello, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Sarah, for inviting me and the rest of the CPW team for putting this all together. Um, a special shout out to my parents who are here tonight. It's my mom's birthday, and she is spending her birthday listening to me talk. So. <laughs> If you see her after this, make sure you wish her a happy birthday, please. Um, I wanted to start with a few images that are not my own, and there will be quite a few during this presentation um, as an orientation into the work I've been focusing on for the better part of the last decade. This is Alexander Latour. He is a fictional character played by a real Cajun uh boy named Joseph Boudreau from South Louisiana in the film Louisiana Story, which um, came out in 1948. He is the main character in the film that tells the story of his family's relationship with the encroaching oil industry that wants to drill um, behind his family's plot of land. And aside from being visually stunning, the film is significant because it was commissioned by the Standard Oil Company to promote their drilling ventures in Louisiana. So it's a, it's a propaganda film, um, one that was nominated for an Academy Award and was selected for preservation in the U.S. National Film Registry um, for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. So we'll come back to this in a little bit. These are some stills from the film. Um, to situate you with where I'm visiting from, I live at the end of the Mississippi River watershed, a watershed that spans 41% of the contiguous United States and stretches into two Canadian provinces. Um, all of that water passes through New Orleans, which is the dot right there at the bottom and into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, all of that sediment that comes with it has historically been a land generator for the state. I took this photograph a few years ago from the Port Eads Lighthouse, um, looking south at South Pass where the river meets the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River has a bird's foot delta, so there are three passes and this is the one that's in the middle. 
So before we go into a few projects, um, there are some concepts that I explore in my work that are relevant to the types of pictures that I make. The first one um, or theme or idea is about the history of landscape art and how we create and perceive the value of land. I'm originally from here in the Hudson Valley. Um, so I'm sure to a lot of you, this uh, painting is familiar. Um, where it's the first landscape in the country that was commodified for leisure and where the modern day understanding of tourism really began. Artists like this, Asher Durand, Thomas Cole, um, really created a market for American scenery by partnering with businessmen and curators at the time who had a particular interest in establishing a specifically American school of art, separate from the British and American classical landscape painting. A result of this kind of set the precedent for what landscapes were seen as more beautiful or worthy of celebration and thus protection in this country. And with photography, hi. The work of uh, Carlton Watkins out west influenced the creation of our national park system, which directly shows the correlation between art and policy. Um, the work of Ansel Adams in the west and George Massa in the Great Smoky Mountains also falls into this category. The second theme is about how we visualize climate change and understand disasters. These are typical stock images to describe the impacts of the climate crisis, along with wildfires and floods. You know, we've all seen the, the sad polar bear visuals here to kind of be used alongside articles that talk about global warming, the climate crisis. Um, and that's what they've ultimately kind of become. They've become visuals that are ultimately dissociated from our everyday lived experience. Um, in Louisiana, the images of disaster that are the most circulated are from Katrina or after a storm like Hurricane Ida or aerial imagery to communicate land loss. And this isn't a critique of this type of imagery or me suggesting that this type of uh, photography has no place in our visual culture, but I'm interested in alternatives to the disaster oriented narratives to try to get at the causes rather than only impacts. Um, disasters don't happen in a vacuum. Decisions are made along social, economic, and racial lines around who ultimately suffers the most. Um, these are some maps that demonstrate the severity of Louisiana's land loss crisis. Um, so just to kind of, I know that there are folks in the room who are aware of this, but just to provide some context, this map was actually made in 2004, but it's one of the most popular graphics used to showcase the uh, land that's been lost since the 1930s and projected into 2050. The state's lost an amount of land that's equivalent to the size of the state of Delaware if you're looking at a land mass. Um, and that's due in part to the levying of the Mississippi River, the impacts of the oil and gas industry, and uh, coastal erosion from sea level rise. This is a, uh, the top graphic here is uh, in Terrebonne Parish in Grand Isle. Um, this is Grand Isle right here. And you can see the difference between um, 1932 and 2011 when this was taken. Um, and after Hurricane Ida, which actually made direct landfall at Port Fouchon, which is at the very bottom of that map right there, um, even more land has disappeared. So on that bright note, um, I'm going to show two collections of work that touch on these themes, but in different ways. Um, the first one is... Um, essentially, I started this series in 2020, and it's an exercise in aesthetics and bringing in the elements of the picturesque movement, which were dominant in 19th century landscape art. It's also about putting Louisiana into that conversation about what landscapes are celebrated and tied to national identity. It wasn't until 2019, actually, that Louisiana landscape painting was the focal point of an exhibition at a major American art institution. 
Um, the show was called Inventing Acadia and it was held at the New Orleans Museum of Art. I'm also interested in exploring how beauty can exist and be captured at the same time as an ongoing massive environmental change and destruction and how these multiple realities can really exist at the same time. Um, some of the pictures like this one are, are studies on light and going to the same place on the river or the lakefront at different times of day over the course of a few years. Um, and a lot of my images are vertically oriented, which offers a different perspective to the flat horizon, which is along the Gulf Coast. If you've ever been down there, which is very, very different from the landscape that I grew up in here, which has hills and valleys and changes in elevation, the Gulf Coast is extremely flat um, and beautiful in its own way. The second collection is a deeper analysis of the architecture and infrastructure of the region and is the focus of a book that I have coming out next spring with Columbia Books on Architecture in the City. Um, the book is about multiple, again, multiple realities existing at once and an attempt to counter the singular framing around climate change that we usually see. Um, to organize these images that go as far back as 2014, I have approached the work in a couple of ways. The first is the perception of protection and looking at the infrastructure that's considered to be holding South Louisiana together. Um, I look a lot at historic graphic material and ways that um, this infrastructure has been communicated to the general public, how it's uh, been disseminated, so how is it visualized and what are the less talked about histories of these structures that have led to its distrust that, that is currently present? Um, in 1927, during the Great Mississippi River flood, St. Bernard and Plaquemines parishes were sacrificed to relieve the pressure on the levees in New Orleans upriver, flooding communities and displacing thousands of people. Um, this is a photograph of that dynamiting that, that occurred um, in 1965 as well. Hurricane Betsy caused the city's back levees to fail and flooded the Lower Ninth Ward, which is a majority Black neighborhood downriver. Um, some people believe they were intentionally dynamited, uh, as well as with the levee failures during Hurricane Katrina. So you can see how this distrust and... Um, ultimately kind of these decisions that were made to create sacrifice zones has lasting impacts. And Sarah alluded to this in my introduction, but the right now the Army Corps is building an underwater dam to slow down the saltwater intrusion that's coming up from the Gulf of Mexico up the river. Um, we're in a historic drought in the Mississippi River watershed. So usually that amount of water is enough to push the salt and keep it at bay. Um, but right now the river is so low that you have salt creeping up and threatening the water supply for a million people, including the city of New Orleans. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but it's projected to contaminate the water supply by mid-October. And the Army Corps currently has a plan in place to bring in 36 million gallons of water a day on barges to dilute the drinking water um, in the city. And people already don't trust the core, um, especially to provide accurate data to monitor the saltwater levels. So it's um, something that I don't know if it's talked about that much up here yet, but it's certainly at top of mind for a lot of folks that are down south. So you see that infrastructure is not neutral. It is a physical manifestation of our societal beliefs around who and what is important to protect. Um, and it is not certain, it, it fails and has failed multiple times in the past. And especially after Hurricane Katrina, the investment in this hard infrastructure, which you see here is probably the most prominent, which is um, the Lake Bourne Surge Barrier, which is the biggest design build project in the Army Corps of Engineers history in this country, um, is essentially meant to keep back uh, storm surge from a hundred year storm 
to keep it from flooding Lake Pontchartrain, which ultimately caused the levee failures during Hurricane Katrina. Um, so just, you know, being by this infrastructure and photographing it in ways that I think um, are, are different than seeing it from an aerial view and being very humbled by it. <laughs> you know, these are structures that are ultimately meant to protect millions of people. Um, but it can't be the only solution to the climate crisis and the way that we live with water. So a lot of my work too over, you know, the past 10 years has been photographing places in and outside of the levee protection system. Cause of course all of Louisiana, South Louisiana is not protected by levees. Um, so you, I'll show it a little bit, um, later on, but just kind of the range in architecture that results in being in a flood prone area versus being within the levee system. Um, this is a flood wall on Hain Boulevard in New Orleans East. Um, on the other side of that concrete wall is Lake Pontchartrain. The second lens of this project is, of course, looking at the legacy of oil and gas, which is a primary contributor to the state's land loss crisis. Um, once oil was first found at Spindletop in 1901, the expansion and proliferation of the industry shaped the physical, social, and economic, um, the entire landscape of South Louisiana. There's no part of the state that hasn't been touched. And I'm interested in the ways that this industry has spewed propaganda, like with Louisiana Story, which I started this presentation with. You can see the concentration of pipelines that I believe Shell's projections are 95% of them of LNG, which is liquefied natural gas, um, is concentrated between Texas and Louisiana for the entire country. So uh, a lot of these pictures are getting at kind of how that industry neighbors communities, uh, the way that it's hidden, the way that it really is permeates through every aspect of life. Even with the state's slogans, which is sportsman's paradise, there's a paradox of appreciating the bounty of nature while simultaneously destroying it. This is a photograph of the Chalmette Refinery, um, which is one of the largest in Louisiana, just downriver from New Orleans. You can see it at the very bottom here. Um, the refineries towers. The state has 15 refineries that account for nearly one sixth of the nation's refining capacity and can process about 3 million barrels of crude oil per day. And in 2000 and last year, the state shipped 63% of the nation's um, liquefied natural gas exports. So you'll see driving around, this is on highway 90 um, in Lafouche parish going into um, Cajun country, you see signs like this that go along the highway that are essentially, again, propaganda advertisements by Shell, by other industries that have kind of tied themselves with the environmental restoration work that the state is trying to achieve. Um, the state has a $50 billion coastal master plan to restore working to restore land that has been lost and ultimately keep um, the devastation at bay from the, the marshland and the wetlands that have been eroding into the Gulf. Um, most of that financing actually comes from the BP oil spill settlement. So you have money from oil and gas uh, directly funding the, the disaster that they helped create. And that money is actually set to run out in 2031. So um, it's something that a lot of leaders and people who work in the environmental field are thinking about how and to what capacity that master plan ultimately has to be reduced because the money is not going to be there. And the last kind of focus here is on architecture and what these various building styles say about how we live near and with water. I draw a lot of influence from the Beshers um, and the work that 
they've done with European industrial landscapes and, and seeing this practice is really kind of creating a record or catalog that shows the range and differences in design. Um, this also kind of ends up showing a lack of a comprehensive plan for <laughs> climate adaptation strategies. This is um, in Orleans Parish, actually, which you can see from I-10 if you're um, going across Lake Pontchartrain. This was built for the World's Fair in the 80s that never happened in New Orleans, but the owner built it with the intention of it being a tourist draw for people coming in and out of town. Um, but for example, you know, you can go a mile down the road in a place like Ter Terrebonne Parish and have a slab on grade house next to a house that's raised 12 feet next to a house that's raised 20 feet. Um, so it really talks, it, it demonstrates and I'm kind of, kind of using architecture as a way to look at the ways that financing for home elevation, um, disaster relief aid, flood insurance, all of those invisible policies are kind of shaping the built environment of the state. Um, and that's, all I put together. So thank you. Yeah. Have you been, um, have you been exhibiting this work anywhere? Like where, where are you right now in, in the project? In this project, I've, I have exhibited some of this work. I just, I had a show this spring in Chicago at an organization called Mass Context. Um, they do a lot of work around architecture and are in the design world. And I showed some images from this body of work. Um, but I'm hoping that once this book comes out, there will be a, more opportunities to do that and kind of show a, a fuller range of the collection. Yeah. 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 How do you envision renewable energy changing the, the landscape in Louisiana, like solar and um, wind energy that might be coming in? Yeah. Yeah. So Louisiana is a deeply, deeply red state. Um, the relationship between oil and gas since its founding essentially has been part of the state's political identity and the history of that has meant that there is such a um, sinister relationship between oil and gas and politics and that sub that has been subsidized. Um, property taxes have not been paid on those industries, those types of things where the reason, I don't know if you've ever been to New Orleans, but um, there are a lot of, there's a, a lack of investment in public infrastructure because the tax base is so low um, because of these industries that ultimately get subsidized and don't need to um, uphold their end of the, the deal. So the, the people that I work with, a lot of organizations that are doing just transition work and um, really highlighting that the idea that Louisiana oil and gas provides so many jobs for the states is actually false. Um, they've been firing thousands and thousands of workers since the early 2000s and has been moving to um, automated and ex, you know outsourcing that labor. Um, but the kind of the relationship with with the political leaders in the state is still very strong to the point where getting any sort of renewable energy in is met up with a lot of opposition. Um, there are a lot of, again, people who are doing the on the ground grassroots organizing to try to make the state more environmentally just. A lot of that looks like working with communities that are kind of fence line communities and cancer alley, which is the stretch of river between Baton Rouge and new Orleans, which has the highest concentration of refineries. Um, so work is being done, but it's certainly not to the extent of places like here, um, for those reasons. Yeah. I'm curious to know how recent, uh, the house is, uh, or when people started uh, lifting their houses up higher. Yeah. Those photos are amazing. 
Thank you. I, it's so fascinating to me and something that as I've been learning more about in my time there is really about whether or not, um, you can finance that elevation yourself or if you're relying on some sort of external financing, like disaster relief aid or FEMA money to elevate your house. Um, and it's also interesting looking at a lot of these places and the, the difference between someone's primary residence and then someone's camp. So people who come from more affluence are obviously able to raise those structures on their own. Um, but people who are living in places that are at a lower socioeconomic level um, rely a lot on FEMA aid to do that. And relying on anything bureaucratic takes an incredibly long amount of time. There are people that I know who still from Ida, which happened two years ago, have not been able to get their house elevated um, because of a contractor shortage. So it's unless you're able to kind of you can get the materials and build it and raise it yourself, you're reliant on that skilled labor to do it for you. Um, so I think it's just really interesting for me personally, um, looking at this architecture and seeing the store, like using it as a way to get into all of these stories around access to wealth and aid and um, ultimately who's going to be able to live in these places and who has flood insurance because a lot of the times you're required to elevate your home or else you can't insure your house. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, connected to this, I was in Houston when Harvey did, and I know that uh, people who, who wish to elevate their houses and, and use FEMA money, um, there was a rule that, that uh, the, the house had to flood at least two times before they could get money. So those people who can't, you know, I mean, how many times do you have to go through that trauma mm -hmm. and losing everything before you actually uh, get access to the, uh, the government? Yeah. So, and Louisiana is actually, I don't know so much about Texas and Houston, but Louisiana is undergoing an insurance crisis, especially in the past two years of so many providers just dropping policies and pulling out of the state because of risk. And you have these properties that are being hit over and over again, and they're a business. So the outlook is not looking good. And um it's also interesting getting into kind of the history of insurance and how the federal government subsidized the national flood insurance program to move people into these high risk zones to create more, a bigger tax base. And now you have these people stuck in those areas with no plan to move them out. So it's a question of responsibility and accountability and kind of there's more than just meets the eye. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, like, having lived in Louisiana, I, I see the style of architecture is pretty prevalent in mm -hmm. southern Louisiana. And I'm wondering, like, especially since with your background in architecture, is this like a similar, like, solution that other parts of the world that are also experiencing land loss and rising waters, like, is, or is this sort of like a FEMA solution? Like, is well, is this even a solution? Is it sort of like putting it off to an Yeah. I mean, it's a solution to an extent, right? Just as the infrastructure system that protects New Orleans is, you can't just rely on that. There has to be other systems, social systems in place, potentially moving people out of these places. Um, I will say that Louisiana has such a strong relationship and history with living with water just because of its ecosystem and the natural environment there. Um, it is a very unique landscape. So I, throughout the Gulf Coast, you know, you, you have these beach towns that uh, houses are raised similarly to a 12 foot, 20 foot elevation. Um, but I'm particularly drawn to just kind of the range and just how crazy some of, I should, I wish I put more pictures in here, but um, just the approach to what will be most protected, this dome house, which is a camp. It's not someone's primary residence to my knowledge, um, but that's a lot of money 
to, you know, with the material and the elevation and also just, you don't have flood insurance if you live in that part of Orleans Parish, um, or it's very, very difficult to get it. So, you know, different coastal environments are adapting in different ways, but I think that what unites them all is the, what the federal response is. And like I said, kind of the lack of a comprehensive plan for if you're choosing to stay, what that looks like. And if you even have the desire to leave, is there a plan in place that would move you? Um, Cause in Plaquemines parish, which is the last parish before the Gulf of Mexico, um, there are people who there are, there is essentially some sort of buyout program that happened after Hurricane Ida, but the amount of money that was presented to homeowners is equivalent to what the market rate of your home is now, not when you bought it. So you have no one that's trying to move to these areas. Um, so the, if you were to get that chunk of change, you wouldn't even be able to like buy something somewhere else. Um, so yeah. What you were talking about, how people's communities are so tied in with the area and what is available to them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just moving their house. And yeah. It's not commensurate with what you're losing at all. And no, it's not as easy. You can't pick up a town of culture and move it somewhere else. And especially there, I think there's such a deep generational tie to the land um, that is just impossible to replicate. So, yeah. Yeah. You can go first. Go um, I was just going to bring up because I feel like you kayak and you think about uh, some of the water photos, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I do love to kayak. Um, Jess is a friend of mine who I ran into randomly over the summer with my dad. We were kayaking in Tivoli Bays and pulled up on the dock and Jess was sitting right there and I hadn't seen her in years. So it was very serendipitous, but um, yeah, I do like kayaking a lot. I have a friend who I don't take my inflatable kayak into the swamp. That's kind of, I don't, I have a friend who has like a hard kayak that we will go out together in. And it's just amazing to be able to get out there. And there's a lot of, you know, places that you need to get to only by boat, especially in the Atchafalaya Basin and places outside of um, New Orleans that are just so unique in the ecology and the houseboat architecture there. Did you still have one? Yeah. Uh Kind of two parts. So do you, do you have a sense of, is there a timeline on the supply of crude oil and natural gas in the area? Like, are they going to run out? And will the water be okay eventually? Oh, man. Yeah, like the water in the land. <laughs> <laughs> it's not looking good. But um, I don't know if what the timeline is on supply, honestly. I mean, our current federal leadership is not he ran on a platform of moving away from fossil fuels, but his actions and policies have not uh, demonstrated that. So especially in Alaska, you know, we have more spaces that are open for, for drilling now. So I don't know what the supply, like the data is on that. Um, Crude oil, liquefied natural gas is kind of the bigger, the more prominent fossil fuel right now. Um, we have refineries that are being built currently, which is just so crazy to see and understand the amount of land that has already been lost is, is continuing to disappear. And at the same time, these, to your question around renewable energy, like the state is still fully subsidizing so and encouraging. Building, yeah. So. Oh yeah. You will, the same place where I'm talking about people can't sell their houses down the street is where those refineries are currently being built. So it's just, it's crazy to, to see that. And it's ultimately making South Louisiana sacrifice zone for the rest of the country that is reliant on fossil fuels. So, um, but I do, you know, not to be a complete downer, there are a lot of people that are working on the just transition movement, moving away from fossil fuels and what that looks like for workers in the state. Um, 
and also, you know, greater environmental justice work, which is more about the social and economic aspects of being surrounded by those industries. Yeah. Is this book of yours? I'm trying to connect the book just because it doesn't seem like it's specific to Louisiana based on the title, but is it based off your work in Louisiana? Yeah, it's so all Louisiana. I wasn't sure if it was like, because it was Columbia Books in New York, I was like, is it oh. New York City? No, well, it has nothing to do with Colum like New York. It's all yeah. Louisiana stuff. I think they just put those two together. No, they, um, no, it's all Louisiana work and it's i'm really excited about it um i convinced 15 contributors to write short essays for it um all folks that i very much respect and admire their own work so it ranges from um chefs to musicians to um people who are doing hardcore grassroots organizing so it'll be a really nice um intertwining of storytelling and material but yeah tbd spring any other questions well thank you Virginia. Oh, oh just the reason why they were destroying the, the levee mm -hmm. and that was the place trying to train into inlet what was your reading for? So in the 1927 flood specifically, it is about mm. um, relieving pressure on the levees in New Orleans, which from this photograph, New Orleans is about 10 or so miles upriver, 20 miles maybe. Um, so it's to protect economic assets. It would be easier to blow up and flood a bunch of agricultural communities then blow risk the levees breaking in New Orleans and flooding the city. So it was a decision that was made to sacrifice one community to preserve the city. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, a long history of violence associated with the levy system and even its creation using prison labor. And um, it, it's, it's something that I try to get out with some of my work is just kind of breaking down this idea that the infrastructure itself is a neutral structure, that there are human decisions that go into this engineering that are based on societal beliefs and values that one may hold um so yeah but thanks dad <laughs> virginia may um this project may already be on your radar but if it's not you should take a look at death of a valley mm. by dorothy lang and purple jones mm -hmm. where she they made photographs of a farming community in Napa valley that was Erased yep. when a dam was constructed in the valley flood. Yeah. And uh, that's some of the best work. Yeah. No, I've seen some of those images. They're amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, those types of sacrificial acts have happened all over, including what my dad was talking about with the Ashoka, the entire reservoir system up here, you know, having uh, communities displaced and destroyed for the ultimate benefit of the city and communities where you're creating this resource and it's not talked about all the time. So, well, I talk about it all the time, but <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. Should we take a couple minutes, get some snacks and coffee and we'll come back and we'll pick up Thank you so much.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you, Virginia. Um, next we have Nicholas Pollock, who's a photographer based in New York, whose recent monograph, Meadow, uh, was published by Hermer Verlag of Munich in 2022. His works have been exhibited internationally and are held in collections, including the Museum of the City of New York and Zimmerly Art Museum at Rutgers University. In 2016, he was nominated for an ICP Infinity Award, Mac First Book Award, and he was shortlisted at Self-Published Riga. He published a monograph of his celebrated project, Nothing Gold Can Stay, which can be found in numerous collections, including the Whitney Museum of American Art Library and the Museum of Modern Art Library. Publications that have featured his work include Juxtapose Magazine, Vice, and Vogue. Can we welcome Nicholas to the stage? Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming out. Hopefully it's it's been entertaining so far. You did a great job. I have to like step it up now. Um, so mine's gonna be a little probably more rambly and freewheeling, but I'll do my best to get through it. I put way too many slides in here. So um, I had to dig through a hard drive for like a really long time to find this picture and the next one. This is like 2006 in the New Jersey suburb of Livingston. Um, I grew up in the suburbs in Jersey, about 40 minutes west of Penn Station in New York. Um, and for a while I made pictures with like disposable cameras. And then when I got to college, I was able to actually like study photography and have access to a dark room and that kind of stuff. So this marks the beginning of that time around 2005, 2006. Um, and I think growing up in the suburbs and watching people, just the way people interacted with the land, I mean, you know, clearing areas, constructing McMansions, uh, paving roads, all, all this kind of activity. Um, I think it informed this kind of binary that took shape in my mind. It, it was a very black and white issue um, where it was like, there's people and then there's nature. And, and those two ideas were like kind of lodged in the left and right part of my brain for a while. Uh, and over time, and you'll see in the work, um, it's become less of a black and white thing, less of a one or a zero. There's more of a gray area. Um, but during this time, I was like, yeah, people versus nature. And uh, when I was in school, I had this great instructor named Akra Shep. Um, he works a lot with a large format camera. He prints on all sorts of cool paper. And uh, anyway, he was putting multiple negatives together. And so I started copying him a little bit with my 35 millimeter and putting multiple frames together and kind of bracketing and just seeing how I could mirror this, you know, the idea of a road cutting through this kind of pristine landscape. This is actually in Westchester. Uh, county in New York. Um, but yeah, the idea of sort of the frame lines bisecting a piece of film in the same way that you would cut through a physical landscape, things like that. So this is like 2007, 2008. I'm making all this black and white work. I couldn't, this was like the only good example I could find of it, but a uh, instructor at school was like, yeah, your pictures are good or whatever, but like, have you seen this book? Have you seen the new topographics 
uh, photographs of a man altered landscape from 1975. And I didn't know anything about fine art photography. I, I was just a kid from the suburbs making pictures of buildings and landscapes and whatever. And so I looked at Robert Adams and Louis Baltz and all these people, and uh, they had already done what I was doing, but better and like many times over. And I was just kind of like, I was devastated, but it was also really like heartwarming because I was, I became obsessed with like Louis Baltz and Robert Adams and all these people. And I was like, these are my people now. I have people. There are other people out there that are really weird and going to like parking lots and making photographs. So it made me feel kind of cozy and good. Um, the other thing that I picked up along the way was uh, people writing about this experience of going out and walking around the landscape and paying attention to things like the creek that runs through town, how it runs oftentimes parallel to like the train tracks and why that might be, things of that nature. Um, Outside Lies Magic, just for you guys, John Stilgo, great writer, great geographer, great landscape historian. Um, and Outside Lies Magic was like my primer, my intro into this whole idea of how we uh, interact with the landscape. And this is like the very first paragraph, but you could pretty much redact all of it and just say, get out now and explore. Um, it's like a really beautiful thesis. It can apply to any aspect of your life. You don't have to be a photographer. I think it's really applicable to photography the way that I use photography, but it can just be something as simple as like taking a different way home from work or making a left instead of a right or whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's just those little things and sort of trying to get into a rhythm and tune in. The other component was Peter Henry Emerson, uh, really old school, kind of stuffy, kind of boring, but life and landscape on the Norfolk Broads, 1885, 86-ish, uh, really beautiful portfolio of people existing with a very unique kind of marshy landscape that to me was very reminiscent of the New Jersey Meadowlands, which is near where I grew up, which we'll get to in a second. But so like new topographics meets outside lies magic meets Peter Henry Emerson was kind of where my head was at. And I started shooting color film and I started using a larger camera. So I started using a view camera, like a four by five inch view camera and a six, seven medium format camera. And I was ingesting a lot of like 1970s color images. Um, and I was basically just educating myself in the art of photography, but I wasn't really interested in participating in like the coded, like this is a reference to William Eggleston or whatever. I just, I wanted to know what was out there. I wanted to find my people. Um, and so, I, with all of these tools, utilized the Bronx River. That was my waterway that was local to where I was living, where I was going to school. And I decided that would be my map. I'd follow it from its sort of origin, headwaters that had been dammed uh, to its sort of end point in the Long Island Sound. Um, and I would embrace whatever I encountered along the way. Um, it was always a push pull, like how much physical river versus how much just other stuff. Um, but it passed through all sorts of places. The Metro North railroad sort of sandwiches it. So it's actually really hard to get to the river. Sometimes, um, it passes through the Bronx botanical gardens, the Bronx zoo, like trying to get to it through like enclosures and stuff. This is actually the fence of an enclosure at the Bronx Zoo because I couldn't get any closer to the river, but uh, stuff like that. Just spending time walking with my camera out, 
in different weather, different seasons. Um, this is, so the Bronx River, the East River, and Long Island Sound all meet here. It's a place called Soundview Park. It's really, really pretty, um, but sort of just surrounded by really serious urban poverty. Um, so it's not, it's not like a place where you want to hang out at late at night, but it's really nice in the daytime on the weekends. Um, so these are some more of this work from the Bronx River, which I, I still haven't done anything with. Like I never made a portfolio or a book. It just sort of lives in the ether. Um, but I'd love to do something with it. Um, just looking at it, talking to you guys is like, man, um, something. Uh, okay, so 1970s stuff I was really into. I was also getting into, like, we were talking earlier about Gem Southam, uh, these sort of British large format color landscapists. Um, you know, I was thinking about that kind of stuff sometimes. But I was a little scatterbrained. I was still finding my way. I was introduced to the work of Mark Steinmetz around this time. Um, really great sort of lyric documentarian, uh, just like beautiful, really like slays your heart consistently, uh, with his, uh, just, it's like his tonality, his use of black and white, his ability to just like make you feel, uh, I, I think as far as like living, working photographer, he's pretty, he's pretty good. Um, so this is a picture of the New Jersey Meadowlands. I keep coming back to it. You'll see why, but, um, it was this view from the train that, uh, really got me every time. I just, everyone's like looking at their newspapers or their phones or whatever. And I'm just like glued to the window like this there is stuff out there. There is stuff to be photographed. Um, so fast forward, it's like 2013, 2014. Uh, I'm getting a graduate degree in photography, which sounds really funny when I say it out loud, but I did do it. Um, I was listening to this album a lot. Um, Love Supreme by John Coltrane. And I have to get this right because I made a note in here. Um, the spirituality of genuine doubting. This is, these are the words of Cornell West from like an old, old PBS interview, him talking about Coltrane. But in relationship to this, I was rereading this. I found like a collection of Chekhov plays when I was maybe in high school, I think it was my mom's. I read it late at night. I didn't understand it, but I read it because I was like, this is good. I don't get it, but it's really good. So I, I went back to it later because there was a park that I found in Newark called Branchbrook Park, and I ended up making a body of work there. But it's home to the largest concentration of cherry blossom trees in the United States. They call it cherry blossom land. And in the spring, there are these huge festivals, and it's really cool. But anyway, Cornell West on Chekhov and Coltrane, uh, I find the incomparable works of Chekhov to be the wisest and deepest interpretations of what human beings confront in their daily struggles. His acute sense of the incongruity in our lives is grounded in a magnificent compassion for each of us. Chekhov leads us through our contemporary inferno with love and sorrow, but no cheap pity or promise of ultimate happiness. He's wrestling with the steady ache of misery, the constant heartbreak of daily life. And it was that constant heartbreak of daily life part where I was like, damn, okay, we got we got work to do. Um, Steinmetz has, you know, laid the groundwork. And uh, so this is the cover of the artist book that I ended up making. Nothing Gold Can Stay was photographed in 2014. Pretty much, yeah, it took me like one year, 2014 into 2015. 
uh, black and white film using the medium format camera. I was surveying this park. I felt like I was working for like Frederick Law Olmsted or something. It was an Olmsted design park. Um, but uh, it ended up being, I would find myself at this one structure, just I think to get out of the sun sometimes, just to like rest. And it turned out it was sort of like the hub. It was a popular spot, especially on Saturdays and Sundays for these kids that lived in the area, went to school nearby. Um, oh yeah, I was shooting in tandem with like a Fuji Instax wide. I was really interested in getting this like extended moment. Um, I was also watching a lot of Andre Tarkovsky and I liked the way he was able to switch between black and white and color. I hadn't really seen people do that successfully. So I was, I was kind of into that anyway. Um, yeah, it was, it ended up being these young kids, mostly young men or boys. Um, they were just... They were living in a part of Newark where no one wants to live. It's really just dangerous and bad. And the park, even though the park wasn't safe at night, during the day, it was a pretty like tranquil place where you could find some peace. Um, and that's what I ended up photographing or trying to kind of capture. It became more of a coming of age narrative. Uh, Yeah. And I had to get the cherry blossoms in. The book is primarily black and white in the mid section, sort of the middle of the sequence. Uh, there's some color and then a few full page spreads of, uh, of the cherry blossoms. But then it's back to black. Yeah, that's that tandem again. <clears throat> How am I doing? Is this, this all right, time-wise? Yeah? Cool. Can we ask a question or should we wait? You can ask. Um, I'm wondering, what, like, was there a dialogue between you and these? Oh, yeah. I was a weird guy with camera gear to them. Um, they were actually part of the impetus for using the Instax because they could not, for whatever reason, wrap their heads around that my Mamiya didn't have a screen on the back. And they wanted to see what I saw. So, hence, instant film. And it was a great takeaway, you know? Then they were like, I became like whatever, a CVS to them. Um, they could come and I'd take their picture and they'd get a little print. Uh, but yeah, there was always an exchange. I connected on Instagram with some of them. I'm still, I mean, we're not in touch regularly, but I'm still like, some of them are grown. They have kids of their own. It's like, I don't know, life's crazy. <laughs> I knew them when they were just kids. Um, it's a Larry Clark picture. I started branching out away from like the classical archetypes of 1970s color and some of my references coming out of this work were from Larry Clark and this guy, Tobias Zaloni. Um, who does a lot of interesting things, but primarily is working in like housing developments, housing projects and photographing young people. So it's, it's a little on the nose, but I think it's pretty good. Um, as far as the book, um, I was looking a lot at the guide. I, I did come back to Eggleston, he got me. In the end, um, as far as like the looking at masculinity, like looking at these young boys who were becoming young men, um, I had to nod to Eggleston. 
Um, and then as far as the like physical layout of the book, which I wish I had an example here, but um, it was this Mikael Schmidt catalog that I found at MoMA. And because uh, I, I just was really trying to justify to myself having nothing except an image on, on the page. Um, but anyway, so these are just some, some spreads from that. And uh, finally, we get to my most recent work, which I started in 2015. So I was coming out of grad school 2015 started shooting this work, which I had wanted to make for years of years of riding that train and looking out the window and running around Newark and photographing there. Um, and I started with black and white again, and it worked, but then I was like, wait a minute. I remember now Ray Mortensen, Ray Mortensen did this and he did it better than anybody's ever going to do it. So I'm not going to, it's, it, it felt like uh, going and like, I don't know, saying something nasty to his grave, even though he's still alive, you know, it, like it wasn't appropriate. It wasn't kosher to offend this work. Uh, and then of course there was uh, Joshua Lutz. He was the other metal person. Um, and these were from like 2008. I think that was part of why I didn't do it. I think I went to people and sort of pitched the project, showed them prints, and they were like, Josh Lutz like just did this. You should not be doing it. I think that was kind of whack, but whatever, you know? I listened, I was young and naive. Um, it's also Rackstraw Downs, who's a British painter. This is a view of the Hackensack, which feeds the Meadowlands or parts of it. I was spending a lot of time uh, along the Hackensack. And for my purposes, I was thinking of uh, Bruegel, the Elder, way, like, way back. Um, but 1500s seemed relevant to what I was doing because sort of like with the park, I was doing these surveys and it was working, but it wasn't. And then I met this group of um, long haul truck drivers. They parked their trucks on like this dirt lot. And I, I could see it from the train, like from one of these double decker trains, I saw something out here and I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna get there, but there's something there. And I ended up meeting these guys and they became the heartbeat of the work because I didn't, I mean, I wanted to make these pictures, but I didn't want to make like a, a whole body of work of this. I, it's not where my heart was. Um, my heart was with this guy, Eugene. Um, it's like a Cuban born truck driver who came by way of Miami lives in Union City, New Jersey, um, is like the center of attention. He's always like up to something. But uh, these guys, they mostly hung out, played dominoes, um, drank beers. They would like barbecue sometimes. Um, and I just tried to be like a fly on the wall sort of. I mean, they liked it in the same way that the young kids liked it because I would gift them prints and they were like, Oh, this is really cool. But most of the time I was just being a creep with a camera, you know? And this is what became the book. This was like the kitchen. dancing. This was like one of the only times a woman was there. All these guys were like married and had families. And this was kind of like their outdoor man cave. 
And Eugene was like, you can never show this picture to my wife. Never. And I was like, dude, chill. But yeah, he loved having the animals around. It was, I think, like a memory from when he was young in Cuba. There were just like animals. So he would go to agricultural fairs and stuff and buy these ducks and chickens and whatnot and keep them. And uh, so I wrapped that up right when the pandemic was starting. I, the writing was on the wall. I was like, pandemic is not going to equal good things for hanging out with a bunch of people, uh, eating and drinking and doing all this fun stuff. So I wrapped it up. Uh, it was pretty much coming to an end, but I, I wrapped it up and, uh, and started working on editing it for a book. Um, and then I just have a couple of, these are the last slides. So I think I did it. Um, I've been, really interested, this will sort of, it's sort of a trilogy, the the young kids in the park, Eugene and the truck drivers in the Meadowlands, and then the port of Newark, um, which is like the invisible labor, but also like the humanity. I've been thinking a lot about Milton Rogovin's work. Um, I've just, it's the biggest issue I'm having now is access. It's mostly like security stuff and but I think it's important work um, I think you know trucking was not central to the Meadowlands work but trucking is like its own can of worms and I think this I mean Alan Sakula plus Milton Rogovin Port of Newark is I think where it's at so thanks for letting me speak Right. I can go back in time. But we yeah. had a question. You, keep, you mentioned a lot about the Meadowlands. Now that's where the stadium is? Yep. That area? That was a little swamp at one point, right? Where that's right. Is. Yeah, it still is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they have trouble building there, even though they just built a gigantic mall. Uh, it's called the American Dream. <laughs> it's a little bit, yeah. But yeah, it's a giant swamp, basically. Yeah. And now so, they want to develop it, make it usable. For there's it. been lots of failed stuff. They just drive things deep, deep down. And sometimes it takes and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Built above it. Yeah. Above the swamp. Yep. <laughs> How do you decide um, in, in the book that had black and white switching to color, how do you decide which photos will be which? And is there like a narrative structure you're trying to follow? There is. So you're talking about, I just want to get there. Like this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's a hand. Um, yes. Okay. So in the book itself, it's, not really interspersed. It's basically a black and white book. And then there's sort of this hidden chapter in the middle where you see all the color. And what was the reason? I felt like Branch Brook was like a crown jewel and it was like buried. It was buried in Newark and it was hidden. And I felt like, I don't know, you had to be a really attentive reader of the landscape and of the book to like get that reward. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned in the beginning of the talk that uh, this dichotomy between humans and nature. And it sounds like over the years that you, you've, you've made that relationship more and more complicated. You found the complexities yeah. over the years in that. And I'm curious how your ideas have changed about that since you've been making all this work. Yeah. Where, where are you at these days? Uh, these days I, I vacillate. It's horrible. Yeah. Uh, between like complete 
sort of fatalism, like uh -huh. George Carlin style, like, yeah. uh, like there's nothing wrong with the planet. Like, it's just us, basically. <laughs> and like, we're here now. Like, I had to swallow the pill that we're here and we may or may not be here in the future. Mm -hmm. And Perfecting. yeah, like all that stuff. It gets me down sometimes, but then this process of like making this stuff actually like is really helpful. Mm -hmm. to like look at it but it helps my soul yeah yeah thank you David yeah also, your book is over here. oh yeah yeah if you want to check it out yeah thank you Conversation, so as well as present their work, but they're going to have how their work intersects really.